document that we give to upstreams and to tell them how best practices in um, making their software suitable for Debian. Um, so this is the document. We've got a number of sections about different things. Um, and today I th thought we'd start with uh, if anyone has any feedback on the document already, have, have people read it? Um, any comments? Uh, that sign sane okay um, that essentially that upstreams are not creative with their packaging and uh, especially well <laughs> one has to be creative if the packaging system is not very smart but uh, something like Python upstreams, Ruby upstreams, what have you, they should have a reasonably um, expressive, declarative uh, packaging system, and it's basically a contract that tells what they're going to do, and the less creative they are, the, the easier it is to make sense of what they've written. So I would say um, non-creative with regards to packaging um, because the interpretation happens downstream of them. Um, uh, yeah, use their packaging system and accept patches because um, they should not be required to know everything. Um, So, um, I, I think I don't want to require upstreams to make perfect packages because they essentially may deploy in their own system and a bunch of others. And Debian can do the work for them of testing their build system in all sorts of places and send patches. And uh, so, it's a service we give to them, not like a nitpicking we do to them. At least... I would like it to be perceived that way. Um, and so it's like, yay, we got your software. It's really good. And this is how you make your build system work in S390. Isn't it cool? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> and I think that that's kind of the dialogue that we should have with upstreams. Um... There's, uh, yeah, things that are an issue for us, and we could explain why they're an issue for us, like including third-party libraries. Uh, and there are things that we can do for them, and uh, they're very welcome to use our experience and infrastructure. Yeah, I think that's about it. Um, to like stimulate the discussion a bit, I, writ I wrote a food for thought section, um, and just by going through the document and uh, looking at stuff that is incomplete or um, needs work. So these are some of the things. So if anyone has any thoughts on any of these items. Um, can we see who's actually read the document at least once? <laughs> huh? That counts, yeah. 
<laughs> um, can we have a volunteer for the f first one? I mean the second one, not the first one. Uh, proofreading it, looking at the grammar and the spelling and, and also contacting the Debian localization English mailing list to help with that. Does anyone want to do that? I'm looking at Kathy over there. Basically, just proofreading and and uh, clarifying things and and um, collaborating with the people who are doing that on the Debian localization English mailing list. Okay, I can do that. Are you just talking to Wiki? Are we just talking about the Wiki? Um, so let's uh, maybe discuss the WAF section because it's uh, so this is what we uh, it's not very readable. So the FTP masters um, object to having WAF build system in Debian for various reasons. Um, and someone added an objection to that. Um, I was, I'm interested in hearing if anyone has any thoughts on the object, objection. It's a random build system that's used by some projects. Are there, si Are there significant uh, software projects that use WAF that this is a concern of, or is this mostly just, I mean, where is it coming into play from? I believe an example is the Samba project. Um, yeah, I bl I'm not sure how many other upstreams use it, but it is used. I wonder if it would be better to have positive recommendations for certain build systems instead of saying, don't use SCONs, don't use WAF, don't use this. Uh, if I'm considering WAF, what are the options that I'm considering? And should we say, Debian would really love if you would use, I don't know, Automake or PyBuild or whatever it is and recommend that. Uh, yeah, um, I think that's a general argument that go, I'm skimming through the, the guide. And if I were an upstream, I would feel defensive after reading this guide, because it's like, you should do this, you should do that. I would rather be happier I would I would not I would feel less defensive if it were worded like in Debian we would prefer this over that because it makes our life easier in that respect. So um um uh yeah like third party code uh please do not include uh I would tend to reply, please do not tell me what to do. Uh, maybe I have good reasons for including it, and uh, wh who are you to judge what I do? But if I read something like, um, uh, other code-like libraries tends to be a problem in upstreams for us because we do security, blah, 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 track dependencies, and so on. Uh, so, if you need to include it, please do it in a way that we can easily disable during build. Uh, that would be more like um, 
uh, uh, requirement analysis for a project rather than somebody finger pointing my my work and saying wrong. Or uh, source only tarpaul, it says, please provide an archive of your source code as blah, blah, blah. That's what our toolchain can currently work with. It could be worded as our toolchain can currently work with this. Um, if you can, please provide one. Uh, at least it comes from a, a, use, a, a proper use case that, that people can reason with and not just, we're not telling people our way is the best way, you suck if you don't do it. So some of the incomplete sections is, for example, um, why we have the stable release and why that's a good thing and why we use old versions of software in that stable release. Other distributions like Fedora, they just upload new versions in their releases. Um, so does anyone have thoughts on how to explain this to upstream people? The branching, like Debian stable, and we don't introduce new upstream versions into that usually. Um, that's like a reasonably contentious thing with many upstreams. No. We have the equivalent. That does remind me. There was discussion at the web app off about web apps that have super short security cycles and thinking about a way to put them in the archive in testing and then backports but keep them out of stable and it might be nice I mean this shouldn't be a web apps only thing it's probably gonna be most common in the case of web apps but it might be nice for certain upstreams to know that that option is available and conversely it might be nice as a project for us to decide this is a thing we think is generally reasonable for certain packages to have if we know that the upstream security cycle is short and if we expect security issues during the lifetime of stable okay i guess i do have input um in terms of just a uh, form of argumentation that can make people less defensive and bring them on board into reasoning it out um if uh, if in the documentation explaining to upstream that you include what you predict might be some of their concerns. So for example, um, you suggested PABs, uh, this is why we use stable, et cetera, these, these forms, these processes, uh, workflows, whatever. It is a good thing because blah, blah, blah. Um, we accommodate some inconveniences with the following and then list uh, possible concerns you can imagine many upstream people might have and uh, then encourage them you know some trade-offs between some of those approaches um, and then uh, you and then describe some use cases so if you have some super short security uh, blah 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 you might consider blah 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 <laughs> Does anyone have any thoughts about advice about upgrading data and um, especially and user configuration? Obviously, the uh, the uh, huh? 
obviously you, the package can ha packages can handle um, upgrades of system wide data, but the uh, data and configuration in user home directories isn't upgradable in that way. Um, I think that's a general problem with upstreams that comes with a, a stable release policy or contract that they can have. Some upstreams are aware of this and they will have like stable releases, development releases, migration plans, documentation for it. Some upstreams won't, won't even bother to like keep the same API or the same command line interface from one version to the other. So uh, I think that's not a Debian specific issue uh, it's something I would uh, go through the github people and hit them all over the head with um, and we could uh, say that as a distribution that tries to make stability guarantees across releases we are more likely to do a good packaging of things that have a reasonable development workflow. Uh, and then I wish we could point to some external documentation about reasonable development, state of the art, sort of best uh, practices for releasing free software. I um, don't know if there are any, but I wish that there are. Um, because I think it's not just up to us to say that stable releases exist and API should not be broken across stable releases. Um, right. So we can point to those, um, essentially, and and say that uh, that makes our life easier because uh, we do take care of a uh, stable life cycle. Um, one thing that they could do in that respect is if they chose to do stable releases, talk with the Deb, uh, like have some interaction with the Debian maintainer so that they could coordinate on what is the version that they intend to uh, maintain for a longer time so that the Debian developer can say, I want to upload the new upstream version until stable is released because I want that version to be unstable. To avoid the fact that upstream finds that there's a development version in Debian stable and they receive bug reports about it for two years uh, when they never subscribe to uh, maintaining that for a long time. Uh, so, yeah, um, negotiate with the Debian maintainer what version uh, they commit to maintain for a long time. Negotiate with the Debian maintainer saying, I do not intend to support my software for a two-year life cycle. And the Debian maintainer at that point can choose not to have that thing enter Debian stable, which I think would also be good. Or the Debian maintainer can know that it's up to them to maintain it uh, for two years. At least it's clear. Yeah, or the backports only thing. I don't know. But uh, as, a, as a Debian stable user, then I want to know that uh, the new version I get of that needs to be tested by me because it's likely to break uh, existing things that rely on it. So that breaks the usual Debian stable contract. If you were in yesterday, Francois Marie talk. Okay. Uh, it's like develop stuff with Debian stable and get security update upgrades uh, with minimal hassle. So if a security upgrade means uh, that I need to rewrite my production code, it's not quite the same thing. So I can put in my requirements not to use the stuff that is provided in via the other chan the other faster channel for stable and rely only on the code that will guarantee that I can do a security upgrade with without planning a week of code 
uh, testing and rewrite. Clarifying question, are you, are you s trying to explain what an upstream developer might need to know uh, about choices they need to make about uh, how they will be involved with long-term support of their package and what they might need to give up to some other maintainer? Is that the general area you were just explaining? Um, sorry, I have two things going on in my head and I lose bits. Uh, sorry. Uh, were you explaining uh, what an upstream developer might need to know about what choices they need to make about supporting uh, stable release packages and whether they might need to give up some control to let someone else maintain their packages during that time? Yeah, um, more like the... Um, they should. I would like there to be a conscious choice on upstream of their um, release practices, which could even be, I don't want to bother with them. But at least it's consciously chosen and documented, and the Debian maintainer can uh, act on it. Like. Yeah, yeah. A checklist is a good idea. Do you plan to have stable releases at all? Um, do you plan to do security support for stable releases? Uh, how long do you plan to support a stable release for? What is your current stable release? What is your next plan for stable release? Not demanding that they tell you, but letting them know these are things they might want to think about. Yeah, and and let us know it or let their users know even I think a checklist like that would be pretty useful for uh, upstream um, the <coughs> the part that still would be missing from there is that the there's different uh, timelines for the different projects that um, are not always going to overlap. So uh, that seems like something we can't quite put in a checklist. So by that I mean uh, some upstream project uh, has a release cycle that is a certain release cycle that doesn't necessarily coincide with whatever Debian's release cycle is going to be. And there's unknowns usually in both of those and getting those to synchronize is often impossible, <laughs> uh, especially across all the different packages that are in Debian, and uh, that often causes a bit of uh, friction, I think, with upstream, like, oh my god, you, re you shipped that version? <laughs> why did you do that? Or why did you jam in that beta version into here, or whatever? And I don't know how we can resolve that in a, in a checklist format, but it, the checklist I think could help there to get the upstream to think about what and and plan for what they might want to have in that situation. <laughs> Maybe this is what you were just saying, but it might be worth a packager's guide for how to talk to us upstream and what to check with upstream in addition to an upstream guide for what to do. Um, I mean, I think we can be clear about uh, we've been doing these uh, predictable freeze cycles and things like that. So just being as clear as we can, maybe pointing a link to whatever is the current schedule. Um, so at least we can say, well, the freeze, it, it really should be ready a few months before that. If there's any way we can coordinate um, to get a version that will work for us. Um, Debian could do a lot more there to encourage Debian developers to to do that with upstream um, like when the when the release or freeze date is decided and announced to the project it's all it's often like buried deep in a bits from a, a release team mail and there isn't anything that ever says like hey by the way you should now go to your upstream and say here's the freeze date <laughs> 
we're we're not telling ourselves that we should contact upstream and let them know about that. We just think, oh God, I got to get this resolved before the freeze. And and it's fine if if upstream if upstream saying your release is not my problem, uh, because our release is our problem. Then an upstream can be nice and say cool, or they can say, well, this is my release plan. Deal with it. Uh, both are okay, in my opinion, and we shouldn't tell an upstream you are bad because you don't care about us. Uh, at, but the, the thing is, as long as the, the Debian maintainer knows uh, what's upstream planned, again, they can make choices. Um, which I think ultimately, ultimately ends up with less than maintainable software in stable. Uh, it may end up with a smaller stable, but it ends up with a stable that's way easier to manage. Um, and then, yeah, the, the Debian developer can choose to do backports, can choose not to have uh, the thing in stable. Um, I see only benefits. To continue that discussion, I know one frustrating thing I've heard from upstreams uh, is that um, all the different distributions have different times of releases so they all have different versions of their their software in them and supporting all those different versions across the different distributions is a major pain in the ass um, some organizations like puppet have people that can pay to backport security fixes to six different releases across all the different distributions but many upstream projects can't do that and so they just give up on that um, <clears throat> so there's another point there of uh, uh, the release cycle between Debian and the upstream project aren't synchronized but they also the versions that end up <laughs> Uh, proliferating amongst all the different distributions can really create a lot of problems for upstream and that that's a tension point I've seen with some of my upstreams before when Debian has this version Red Hat has that version uh, Ubuntu has this version and there's it just becomes this giant mess and a problem for them and people go to them and complain when sometimes it's Debian's fault or people should complain to Debian trying to minimize the upstream's uh, frustration in that aspect it seems like a very hard problem that I don't know how to solve but communication increasing that communication with some of this in the uh, checklist to think about those things and try to figure out how to plan for that would help a lot I think <coughs> It, are there central places where release teams provide uh, legitimate, legitimated, <laughs> semi-official uh, graphical pictures of timelines, like project planning flowcharts that help people look ahead? Roadmaps. Uh, if someone produced that, it would be the release team, yes? I think one of the problems with that is that um, traditionally Debian has released when it's ready. Um, so there's a freeze and then we release when we get the RC bug count down as much as the release team thinks is necessary. And so it's hard to, it's hard to draw a timeline that has those things. <laughs> so for a user interface for the reader, you could have the dates in the past and the future events there undated still graphically represented so they can see what the stages are to predict not knowing which dates they'll come no. This is an example of software that you could use to do that. It does have release information in it, um, and you could use the same software and collect uh, information from other distributions and create a timeline of distribution releases and 
that sort of thing. This is the Debian timeline, events in the Debian world. Yeah, I put that in. <laughs> no, a while ago. Timeline.debian.net. Yeah, my suggestion, my suggestion is a new website with Debian's release cycle, Fedora's release cycle, Gentoo release cycle, uh, whatever other distros have a known release cycle. Um, the code base is pretty simple. It's in Debian. Um, yeah, just an idea. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to work on that, I'd be happy to show them how it works. Okay, so, does anyone have, uh, does, what's this? Okay. Does anyone have, the guide has a few sections on uh, Perl and Python and some other things. Does anyone have experience with Ruby, Node.js, Haskell, PHP, Go, any of the newer languages um, and th pitfalls to avoid in packaging and that sort of stuff in those languages? Have you tried re reaching out to the respective teams about for those languages? Not yet, no. But that's a great idea. So my experience with um, many of these, uh, uh, I think you're you're knocking your blue pin out or your your red pin out. Um, with many of the sort of less mature languages, the notion of API or ABI stability hasn't really sunk in yet. Um, and that is something that I think Debian tends to actually care a lot about because we care about if your package is useful, we care about the things that use it. <laughs> um, and I think that ends up being significantly problematic for um, for Debian and for the upstreams. Um, I know I've seen it in Ruby. Um, Haskell manages to avoid the problem by making everything statically linked and not having any libraries at all so that it's build time dependencies and when you build a package it just creates a big bundle and ships that like if the API changes well if the API changes then it doesn't build and then it doesn't and then it doesn't go into the archive right um, so but then that means that if there's a security flaw in one of the um, in one of the libraries that's being used the only way to fix that security flaw is to actually recompile every single package in the archive that was ever built against it. Um, and I don't know how many of you have Mono installed in your systems, but um, Mono strikes me as one of the situations where you can't do an up a Mono update without basically updating all 400 megabytes of Mono or whatever on your system, which is, I think, really problematic. Do you know, does anyone know if uh, the security team is aware of, um, of the Haskell situation, for example, and how do they deal with that in stable and so I, I don't know specifically my impression is that there's not a lot of security auditing that's going on in the Haskell or um, I think I believe that go is the same in the same situation and I, don't, I think that there's not a lot of security um, review in that so with Haskell, it shouldn't be much of a problem. Uh, so the, the static linking shouldn't be much of a problem because they have a master file of Doom 
uh, knowing all the version of everything and uh, if they need to up update a library then they will rebuild all the reverse build dependencies and upload them to Debian. I don't know about stable. I don't know what they do there. Uh, but I think here the problem is not quite about the tools, but about the communities. Because uh, I'm, I would imagine that we wouldn't have many problems from Haskell on that side, because the Debian Haskell people are really good, and they have a very good interaction with upstreams. Uh, we may have problems from Ruby, because uh, we uh, both, and also the Haskell upstreams are pretty serious about what they do. Whereas... Uh, we may have problems like with Ruby of, or Node.js because upstreams are not, let's say, mature enough to think about these issues. And all efforts to talk to them have been met with, we are not interested. So we don't have a good relationship with them because essentially they're not interested in what we do. Uh, and there's not much we can do about it. Even if they had good tools, they just have a community that does not support people wanting to make commi time-based commitments uh, or like uh, interface commitments. Um, so I think the only possible thing in that case is to uh, say let's try again in one year, see if the community has grown up a bit. Uh, but to me, yeah, it's not about tools. It's it, that's why I don't do any paid work that uses Ruby or Node.js. I think some of the reason why that continues to happen in some of those communities is because they uh, they find it hard to not just commit to that time to developing and maintaining a stable API or ABI um, but the <coughs> uh, it it sometimes is easier to solve that for them by routing around us and developing the tool chains to install and upgrade things without doing it through Debian and creating their own distribution dependency management systems and so <clears throat> you have gems and you have bundler and you have these things and it's just virtual env you have all these ways of routing around debian to make it easier and that might be an indicator to us that it might be too difficult what we're doing for them maybe we can reflect on that to make figure out how to make it easier i i don't want to give them an excuse, uh, a pass, saying that <laughs> it has nothing to do with those other uh, languages and their communities, because there's definitely a, a culture and an issue there. But I think saying it's it's their fault, not ours, is maybe missing that. Actually, for us, it it seems relatively easy, but from an outsider, it's quite baroque and difficult to get things into Debian and figure out how to package and do it right in a way that will be accepted and maintained over time plus then the ABI issue oh my god you know so so my impression is that as the outside as these language specific communities mature and develop these version distribution or package distribution systems on their own that are not Debian or Fedora um, that as they mature, as those packaging systems mature and slowly begin to avoid some of the mistakes that we maybe learned to avoid five years ago, um, they become, they start to realize why we care about things like API <laughs> stability and, right? And so once they have a functioning packaging system and they have enough community norms about, hey, yeah, if you're going to release this thing, you might want to think about how long you're going to maintain it for then by that point they're probably already doing the work that we want to do and we just need simple translations between their packaging systems and our packaging systems simple you know haha -ha. but um but what's what what i find sad is that that means that a they're redoing a bunch of the work that we've already done <laughs> and relearning those things and and b that by the time they're ready to 
like make those commitments, they already have a heavy investment in their own infrastructure rather than letting us do that infrastructural lifting for them. Yeah, uh, agreed on all, and um, I think we we there's not so the, those people are building virtual lamp, and and are, are building it because I guess they perceive that uh, doing going our way is a lot of work for no benefit. Um, so I think the problem there is that we fail to communicate what are the benefits in our way. Uh, and there's people who understand the benefits in our way, uh, like the people I work with. Um, uh, uh, but uh, so, uh, like, uh, if you look at, like, I, I did after FOSDEM post uh, on my blog a post called Deb Ops. Uh, which uh, and the point was exactly to explain why we do things the way we do and what are the practical benefits. Uh, why I would not use. Why I think that virtual lamp is not cool. Uh, why I think that vagrant present company excluded is not cool. Um, because that. Uh, in th that makes me like lose hours in my workplace that I could use to go and walk on the mountains. Um, so I think that is something we fail to communicate that you know we don't do this because we are uh, obsessive compulsive. Uh, or we, we maybe, but. Um, uh, and and if we communicate, if we find a good way to communicate that, we also communicate to ourselves. So why are we doing this? Uh, it's also good to have a reminder for ourselves that uh, we're not just respecting the policy because we have a policy, but it's cool that the policy says this because it means that I can rely on that. Um. I I guess I think of it coming from a, a different different perspective than that, uh, rather than like. I think I, I I like to look at it from why it is that, or what what are the reasons behind uh, these different languages um, needing these virtual env and and bundler methods of distributing things, uh, rather than saying why it's not cool that they do that. I think the for the, for these sorts of new languages, they're developing these things because they need to. They have a rapid turnover and development, and need to have updates much quicker than they can get if they go through Debian for that process. So it makes a lot of sense for a developer to use Bundler and Gems and whatever other CPAN. Uh, PyPy or whatever, because when they're developing things, they need the latest versions of libraries, and they need those quickly, and they need to be able to update and um, develop for those latest versions. <coughs> and Debian is not particularly suited for uh, a rapid development cycle in that way, because we have potentially long uh, blockers like new queues and the entire process of getting something packaged by someone who's not a packager can take quite a bit of time. So, um, and that's what, in a way, fosters the development of those infrastructures to a point where they're, they're wanting to replace Debian when things become stable, <laughs> uh, how you move between those two. So, to me, it sounds interesting to think about what, what can Debian do to make things for developers of languages uh, easier to get into Debian sooner so they get the foot in the door so they're not depending on these uh, alternative distribution mechanisms for when we need them to stabilize more. Um, because I think that, well, I don't, I don't know what those ways could be, but 
<laughs> things like PPAs or uh, other ways of getting available packages quicker into the archive or making things less policy stringent in certain environments if you know you're going to have a development environment might might be more uh, or, or lower the barriers for that entry a little bit so where I, where I work uh, <coughs> there's faster development cycles and there's production systems uh, and and I guess the same would work for upstream so Debian stable is the production system and uh, Debian stable it does not mean that people shouldn't have a development environment. Um, and when something comes out of their development environment that could potentially be ready for production and to be supported in production for a reasonably long time, it would be nice if it made its way to Debian stable. So um, again, uh, it could be good to document that Debian stable is not intended to be the bleeding edge production system, the, the uh, development system, it's intended to be when you go to production. Uh, so, yay, rapid release and everything, then something comes out that's worth supporting, and then consider getting it into Debian stable. Um, uh, can we support development environments in Debian? Then, I'd like to. Um, because there should they should give us all sorts of intermediate staging development environments in a way. Uh, I think that's something that our current infrastructure is not particularly good in handling because when I upload to unstable, I upload for stable. There's no this version is some fast moving thing in view of the next stable. Um, so, at the moment, I don't think there's much we can do about that. Oh, just quickly, I, we, we also call it unstable, which scares away most developers I know, because they want to have a functional system to develop on. And so they develop on a stable system, and then they're mad because everything's out of date, and they can't update things. And so. Just the word, the language, like calling something unstable, may may discourage people from actually using it as a development environment. <laughs> so, like the problem is that there's two things that are unstable. There's the packages you're using to develop, and there's like the kernel, Xorg, you know, your disk encryption system, your mail client, all that other stuff. And as a developer, I don't really want my kernel to be changing all the time. I'd like that not to. I'd like that to stay. If I get my hardware working, and I don't replace my laptop, and I just get security updates, I don't need a new kernel basically for the entire life of that hardware. But I do need new versions of like, you know, Python, the core interpreter, that that sort. And one thing that I think is kind of worth thinking about is, which is completely unintentional, uh, is Homebrew, the Mac people, Homebrew, the Mac packaging thing. Uh, they provide development environments, and I see quite a number of developers who are doing all their local development on Macs because they like the hardware or whatever it is, and they do production on Linux. And Homebrew has this implicit property that is providing packages that aren't part of Mac OS. The Mac OS base system is there. I'm not running pre-release versions of Mac OS. I'm running Homebrew, which is giving me whatever I want. And a better way to separate you know, a stable desktop environment plus an unstable development environment and tools for that, I don't know if the right answer is do all your work inside Strute, which is what I've kind of been leaning towards, but is a power user tactic, uh, something like that. Would the use case of HP be useful for describing some of these issues? They work off of testing and they create their own future from there so now they're wondering how to get their work back into stable um so they i i missed some of the, i missed some of the hp discussions so if you can go into more detail about this uh but is the, are they building a local development environment off of testing like this desktop
I will use the wrong vocabulary if I do that. Josh Triplett uh, pointed out some time ago that uh, coordinating with upstream can make it easier to pick a single long-term stable version across several distributions to make life easier for upstream. I just had one last comment that reminded me of, which is how do other distros do upstream guides? Do they do upstream guides? Should we work with Fedora on this and say, you know, this isn't just the crazies in Debian. This is the general consensus of the people doing packaging. I think Fedora and Debian might be enough for that. And conversely, how does DebDry interact with that? So I just wanted to um, describe a bit of recent experience with that kind of coordination, which I think was very fruitful. Um, what's that? We're out of time, you don't get the mic. <laughs> yeah, my understanding of HP's situation is they take snapshots of testing, they develop an entire alternate um, distribution out of it called H Linux. Now they want to switch and work on and work with Debian instead of just H Linux. They want to have Debian, but how to? coordinate their work environment, which completely reproduces so much of what goes between testing and stable, as far as I know. You know, you go from testing to various stages up to another, a new stable. How They do that all through their, their own internal systems, which are huge. How do we help them integrate? If they have made this very high-level commitment to work with Debian, how, does, how do the two uh, cycles get get integrated in a way that's productive for Debian. Yeah, so about the use of testing, I explicitly asked them why they use testing and not stable. And they said that uh, they made their choice because their, their developers asked them to use testing. So I just, um, I wanted to just follow up on your remark about the coordination with other distros. Um, so uh, I w in terms of packaging TCP crypt, um, which we had a boff about earlier this week, I actually uh, was lucky enough to meet with um, Paul Wouters, who works on Fedora. Um, and I mentioned that I was going to be putting TCP crypt into Debian. And he said, oh, we should put that in Fedora. I'll go do that tonight. And um, so, so it's not in Fedora yet because Paul and I both took a look at it and said, you know, we reviewed it and we said, but there, here are a few changes. And we were, I mean, this was, it was useful because there was face-to-face -face interaction also with Upstream. But we basically went together to Upstream and said, hey, we have these concerns. You know, you're not dealing with the Cheroot properly. Like, how are you going to use this separate user account? You know, there's a set of things that will make it easier to put into into distros if you do these things. And both. The fact that it came from both Fedora and Debian, I think, made Upstream say, sit up and take notice and say, oh, got it. Like, we're happy to work with you. It may just be that we had reasonable Upstreams. But that kind of coordination and face-to-face -face communication, which is good, but that kind of coordination is excellent if you can, if you can do it and, and make sure that you're aware of who the other packagers are. Upstream mailing lists are a really good place to do that. Um, identify yourself on the Upstream mailing list as the Debian packager for the software and see if you can you know, you could even ask for other packagers on that mailing list, and then you can contact them out of band if you feel like you need convincing. He hates me representing him, but he, then he can disagree with me and tell me and tell you where I'm wrong. <laughs> Uh, my understanding from hearing Ubuntu and Red Hat and other folks uh, describing Vagrant's role, this is not from Vagrant, is they have said that uh, he was important for facilitating the cross-distribution um, integration of the package so that it was the same across. 
how you did that to make it easier <laughs> for other people to do something like that? Uh, well, one of the ways was by uh, attempting as a Debian developer to make it work on Fedora, which uh, then they went and did it the right way, because I did it all wrong. Uh, but we had tons of users just asking for, hey, when is this going to be available on Fedora? So kind of just like, okay, I'm going to step out of my comfort zone. I'm going to try this Fedora thing. And, uh, and I did that with CentOS and other stuff. But um, mostly just encouraging people to do it, uh, trying to be available, and I don't know, uh, nothing pretty noteworthy. <clears throat> just actually communicating with people and encouraging communication and really discouraging distro wars. <laughs> I just wanted to, to try to, I think we need to try to encourage upstreams to actually think about the errors given off by their builds. And I know this seems like really a really basic thing, that, but it, if you can, like patches that clean up warnings in the build process are things that should be applied if they make sense. Uh, and that, you know, the cleaner you can get your build to be, the, the better our tool chains uh, like breakage in our tool chains will be more visible if the if the build is clean in the first place. This was something that was in the document that you disagreed with. Is it in the document? No, you, you were saying. I was saying I may have missed it because I got in late. I don't know okay. if it was brought up, but I really want to. I want to make sure we encourage that. So I think we should close here. It's after the time, but um, this buff actually uh, an upstream developer just came into the IC channel and asked about it and I put him at Gobby and he added a whole bunch of stuff starting here. Feedback from an upstream developer. Um, and there's a lot of things. So it, it's on my to-do list to like look through it all. It's just organization, right? Yeah, a lot of it is organization. Some of it is other stuff. He's us how to edit the wiki. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm really happy about that, and yeah, I'm going to go through it sometime when I have time. That happened. Yeah, we often get people on mentors asking for help writing upstream software. Anyway, let's close.